And hello, everybody, and welcome. We are doing a joint podcast together. And when I say we, I am Doug King, I CEO am. of Presence. Oops. Wait a minute. This I'm supposed to do the introduction. I didn't call on you yet to do your part. You told me to open today, and, and you couldn't let me open. <laughs> and take five. No, go. And that's who I am. And also, for those of you, you'll be shocked at this, but I'm with Danae today. I know that's a surprise now. And uh, she's, of course, doing Enneagram work. Uh, her uh, entity is Love Thy Number. So, yeah, here we are, Danae. We're ready to go, aren't we? And now, should I say anything? Yes, at th- this is the point. <laughs> This is the point at which you now talk. This is why we should have dress rehearsals, but nah. we're in. No, we nah. have plenty of rehearsals. Sorry, I jumped in. Hello, this is Danae. And yes, we are doing a joint podcast for mm-hmm. our presence audience and for mine over at Love Thy Number. If you didn't hear part one or part two, I would encourage you because this is part three of what we're calling the deceitfulness of good. But part one is where we talk about why. Why are we doing these and putting them on both uh, the separate podcasts? So Yes, and as a matter of fact, the conversations that we're both having just reinforce that the timing of this is is perfect. Uh, More and more conversations today with people who are discussing concepts like unity consciousness, non-duality, Mm-hmm. universal God identity, spirituality. Th- the planet, from a worldview standpoint, truly has been moving, as the model spiral dynamics has shown, for, as a social science and as a historical study. It has shown that we human beings on the planet have continued to overcome boundaries that have separated us over the ages. It used to be at the beginning of time, of course, that the boundaries were things like rivers and mountains and uh, distances that separated us. And we overcame those. We overcame oceans. We found ways to connect the world in terms of being able to navigate the entire planet. And once we had done that, then we came into conflict uh, with people who were different. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. This this is where conflicts come, right? So worldviews have taught us in the spiral that uh, we've had to overcome our differences in terms of our societies, our cultures, our religions, uh, politics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the worldview is uh, an integral part of who we are, and it is headed toward uh, more inclusiveness. And a universal recognition that we human beings have the same value. So what has happened then is um, there have been tremendous changes and reinterpretations of what people believe and how they see things. And that continues to go on, sometimes not without pain, conflict, and chaos. But it is continuing today. And for those that are in presence, well, uh, I'm not telling you anything new. You know that's what we study and talk about all the time because we're talking from a worldview standpoint. And primarily, as you well know, Danae, we're talking about religions. So, again, from an Enneagram standpoint, you can go to a relative's house for Thanksgiving (laughs) and get into a huge religious argument. Well, That religious argument is not about whether you're a five or an eight on the Enneagram. It's a worldview conflict. The same is true with politics uh, as well as religion. Uh, Those are worldview issues that have to do with uh, collectives. Now, uh, at that point, it will, will be extremely helpful to understand the way worldviews evolve and where other people are coming from and how to navigate those kinds of conversations. But before I turn this over to you, let me just one final thing here. Oh, no, take your time. I'm knitting a scarf. Yes. No, I'm I wondered not. what that was. Okay. so uh, I'm finishing my chocolate cake. That's for our friend Dave. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'll flip the script for the, the presence audience. 
Likewise, you could be a spiritual teacher, a pastor, a religious leader, etc., and talk all about uh, religion from a worldview standpoint, and yet your life could be a personal mess. You could have mm-hmm. in your mm-hmm. life all kinds of relationships is- issues. You you could end up having dysfunctional qualities about yourself that even uh, eventually hurt you or require that you can't be uh, in your vocation or position anymore. So to flip the script on this, what I'm saying is, is that likewise, you can't just study worldviews and you can't just study the transformation of the ages and the transformation of worldviews without looking inside of the self, yourself. Absolutely. And that's where the Enneagram comes in. The Enneagram, as Danae and I are discussing now, is really looking into your personal, unique self your personal perspectives, and the way that you personally deal with your life conditions and areas that could be real strengths for you and me and areas that can be real weaknesses and hurt us, cause us and others pain. So there again, just wanted to do a quick intro, throw that out, make sure that we understand from both sides why people like Deborah Uten are combining a study of spiral dynamics and Enneagram Because you've got to have them both to uh, cross-reference and find out where you are on the map. So having said that, I'll turn it over to you. We're going to continue here with Deceitfulness of Good. Any comments you have on that or dig in or where do you want to go from here, baby? Um, Well, I did want to pick up on one thing that you said. You said a lot of times... It comes with uh, pain and conflict or pain and suffering, I'm not sure, that moves us to the next growth spot, you know, in our evolution. And it reminded me of a friend of mine who tore his ACL. And any of you athletes who have had a knee injury and know what that feels like, it is it is bad. So we had to have surgery, replace the ACL. And then there came the time where you had to go to therapy, to occupational therapy, to strengthen the, you know, from the surgery to strengthen the new, where they were, I don't know really what the doctor terms are, but he had ACL surgery. Well, he got really kind of lazy and didn't go to all the therapy that he was supposed to. And what happened was the scar tissue just kind of built up and froze up. Mm. And he had to go back Ah. to the surgeon and have, basically, they had to tear that scar tissue mm-hmm. and talk about pain. Mm. But what came from the recognition that, oh, okay, I really did need to do some work to strengthen this, was that the doctors had said, if you will exercise this mm-hmm. and do what needs to be done, it will be even stronger mm-hmm. than it was originally. Yes. So we hardly ever make a change without some kind of unworkable situation that's causing us pain in our life. That's how worldviews change. That's how individuals decide to take, you know, a leap into therapy or coaching or whatever it is. And so I just wanted to (laughs) say this. We've had a lot of, you know, questions about this from mainly from the presence group because the Enneagram people, they're already on this journey, but um, the presence audience has already been in a growth-minded, you know, a mindset for all the time that you've been through this. You've been, ha- have mm-hmm. had and shown a willingness to expand your awares- awareness. You've um, moved past old paradigms and old ways of thinking, boundaries that were keeping you stuck in your worldview, maybe your spiritual growth. That's hard and that's painful. But you've hung in there and done it for years and moved into new areas of awareness. And so now that you're hearing this about the Enneagram and personal transformation, Doug and I have talked about this and said, look, why don't we do some introductory, just basically introduction to Mm -hmm. the Enneagram, where I go over or we go over Mm -hmm. what the basic concepts are. What are the foundations of each type? And I think maybe 
we're just going to open this up to the presence group. Um, and love thy number if you guys would like to join in. But maybe take three weeks on a Zoom call and just um, have some discovery mm. moments. Beautiful. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good idea. Because if there's one thing that you and I have said since the beginning of <laughs> time <laughs> yeah. or our time with presence is that whatever it is that mm-hmm. we're teaching, mm-hmm. moving past old spiritual be- religious beliefs into new spiritual awareness, mm-hmm. um, worldviews, none of this matters if it doesn't matter in our relationships. And first and foremost is a relationship with ourself, yes. which when we're healthy, when we go through the exercises, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. It, it's going to come with a little pain of awareness of, wait, mm-hmm, what? Mm-hmm. Maybe I was stuck there. But I yeah. didn't even know this about my, mm-hmm. my auto you know, patterns. Um, and yeah, I'd like to see if we can go a little further in relationships with ourselves, with our tribes, which eventually affect the communities, the collectives yeah, that we're in. They do. And let's face it, what keeps you up staring at the ceiling in the middle of the night is when you have those relationship issues. And those relationship issues are, are at home. They're in marriage, uh, parenting, grandparenting. They're with friends and, and associates, extended family, et cetera, et cetera. Those conflicts that come up in our lives are what really keep us awake, and they happen on two levels. They happen on a worldview level. Like I said, if it's Thanksgiving and we're a big argument, that's a worldview argument, religion or politics. Or we have those people that we just seem to butt heads with all the time in the right. family, or we're constantly in some type of conflict with a spouse or a child or someone else that's a, uh, in our lives, or maybe even someone that we work with, and we're not really thinking about, A, what my perspectives are and how I react to things and what is the way that I see things, let alone really dig into understanding how other people react and why they react and how they see things. And that, of course, is the key, again, to this global shift that we're experiencing where all of us deep down inside really do hunger for unity. Mm, We want love and acceptance on all levels. Bingo. Very yeah. good. Okay. Well, we're going to continue this one, um, part three, and we're going to start with type four. Again, we're going to talk about what looks good might be deceiving us somehow. And so we're going to go through type four and five and six and eight. That's right. We're going to skip. We're going to go to eight. We're going to go <laughs> four, five, six, eight. And why are we doing that? Oh, because we're going to have some fun on the next one where I'm going to call you out and point out your flaws, and you're going to turn around and do the same thing to me. No, wait a minute. I didn't understand that's what we were doing. Oh. Uh, your <laughs> point. My flaws. I don't remember that you part. Um, <laughs> yeah. What flaws? Yeah. So basically, yeah. what for those of you, uh, again, who have not been in on Danae's Enneagram podcast, especially presence audience people, Danae is coming from a perspective of seven on the Enneagram. I come from a perspective of nine. So we're going to save seven and nine for the last podcast. And we're going to expand the conversation a little bit. We're going to talk about what this actually has meant in our marriage and places where we see things uh, differently and places where in the past we have learned things about ourselves and each other. And I want to share that I had... A friend of mine who is a type two, who has already listened to the type two podcast um, from last week, just really kind of not really pushed back, but kind of felt uneasy. And she said this to me as a type two. She said, until you understand what it feels like to be a type two, I don't, I don't think you understand how difficult it is to hear this concept of what seems so good and the deceitfulness of good. Mm -hmm. I said, I know, I know. And then we had an extended discussion about that. Um, This is just, I'm giving a very brief overview. And yeah, it may be a little shocking at first to hear this, like, well, 
how can this not be a good thing? So right. hang in here with us. And when Doug and I go through our own, we might get a little deeper on our own types. And again, if you've got questions, please reach out to us, and we will do our best to explain ourselves. And I love this idea of you doing an introduction to the Enneagram for our presence audience, probably in June, I think you had thrown out there yeah, that you were mid-June. thinking out there. Yeah, yeah, and and so uh, this will give you an opportunity to learn all nine perspectives because you may be lost. That's okay. Just relax if uh, some of this is not computing, because Danae will take time in June for the presence audience, and she'll have a lot more details on that later. And then from there, uh, you can also receive uh, some guidance from Danae, Danae about how to go to deeper and deeper levels. That's where, for me, Danae, it really got fun, was <laughs> when I got, you know, the type is just just an introduction to the Enneagram overall, and it, it introduced me to uh, the uh, elementary elements. Oh, and yes. then, boy, but from there, uh, you, can, you can keep digging deeper and deeper, and the deeper I went, the more it was uh, real eye-opening for me. So it's great stuff, good yeah, stuff, good yeah. stuff. Uncomfortable at times. That's oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's just that's an indication of growth. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about type four. Who doesn't love a type four? My goodness, so many times they're the ones who bring such beauty into this world. Um, in the sphere of beauty, truth, and goodness, type fours exist so often in that beauty sphere. So they're often called the individualist. Um, But the passion, which we talked about earlier, passion just means the suffering. It's what, what is inside of us that causes us to suffer. So the passion of the type four is called envy. But this isn't like a jealousy. It's not the same as, oh, I like what you're wearing, and I wish I had that. This is more of an internal sense of a lack of being whole, like something about themselves is inherently missing. And they tend to believe that everyone else has that missing thing. Well, they long for that missing thing, but, but they long for authenticity, which leads to a, desire, to a desire to be unique because they actually believe they are unique because others have what they believe they are missing. Mm. So... Type 4s are so in touch with the feeling of deficiency that they seek value in an idealized external experience, maybe through work or even through a relationship, um, or to express themselves through, like I said, through art and song and all the aesthetic things, not, that's not totally type 4s, lots of types are very artistic, but Type four see themselves in, in being unique in what they do. And so, okay, how, where does the deceitfulness of good come into this? Well, they want to be authentic. They are not going to sit around and chat about the weather or, you know, shallow conversations for too long because they have that desire to go deep, to be authentic, to be unique, to find what is missing so they don't conform to you to the world as they might be in you know just the every, everybody else nope they want to be authentic but they resist knowing that there is nothing there's nothing missing in them that envy of i want what's what you have because you have what's missing in me so the, the the desire to be authentic is a good thing. Mm-hmm, it, I mean, mm-hmm. how everybody would love to be with somebody that you just know what you see is what you get. They are authentic. Yeah. But they become so identified with that image of being deficient that it becomes a never ending loop of I don't have what I need, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be uniquely authentic, mm. and mm. then the the desire to do that just leads to more. Mm -hmm. feeling of, I still am missing something. So when you resist knowing that you are whole, then you will continue in that that loop of seeking outside of 
yourself. Right. Okay, so that's yes. just that's a brief one there. That one, all of them we could go into in great length. But let's move on. Type five. Type five's passion is called avarice. Now, in Enneagram language, again, I've said some of these words are uh, interesting, but in Enneagram language, it's not a desire for obtaining money or possessions, but they want uh, their resources. They basically, they hoard their time and their energy. And so type five is often called the investigator, which is a great thing. But the inward focus of this type five um, is, is focused on acquiring knowledge. And that doesn't seem to be a negative thing, right? Right. I mean, right. Isn't it good? Sure. When you're talking to somebody, you want to know that they know what they're talking about. Absolutely. So to gain knowledge is not a bad thing. And to even be um, conservative with your time and your energy, that's not a bad thing either. But here's what happens. In that need to hoard your resources and your energy, um, they begin to resist connection. So they worry that if they share too much of of themselves, they won't have enough left. They won't have enough Mm. energy. They won't have enough time. And so fives are in that withdrawing stand. They they tend to retreat Mm. inward in their mind. And so... Again, it's this resisting connection. Mm -hmm. They're hoarding their time and their resources and their energy, Mm -hmm. and they're resisting connection with other people. So this, ultimately, it it builds a wall between them and others. And so you're not going to see, you know, fives Mm -hmm. tend to be that. They can't, they don't have, they're not always quiet. I don't mean that. Right. But sometimes it's like you have to pull that connection out Mm -hmm. of them. So in addition, not only... Do they become detached from their relationships? They can become detached from their emotional self. Mm, whereas the four is oh. very much aware of their emotional self. Yes. The five is going the other direction. And so if I'm an investigator, I'll just use a an example. This yeah. is certainly the, the, these are, this is the high level view of all these. It's not not uh, going into great depth. But but an example is someone, uh, if I'm down here uh, studying all the time, I'm the investigator, I can never know enough. I always have to have more books. I have to have oh, yes. more knowledge. I can never have enough knowledge. And I can find myself retreating into that space so that I become kind of like a study hermit. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, in doing the thing that is good which is investigating and trying to have more knowledge, I might not be doing things that are helping the health of my relationships, let alone my own emotional self. Bingo. You get a gold star today. All right. You're not even a type five. Well, this is why I'm trying to summarize it from a novice. I'm I'm coming at it from an amateur, uh, from the presence people side, to uh, just say this is kind of the way I see it. Yes. You know, that's I love yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah. Jumping in there. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go on. And you must know that all the types are just we all have this human, uh, what we were talking about, that it's the universal human identity, yes. this divine identity. Mm-hmm. I am not at all trying to say that people that have this. It's a flaw. It's a flaw. No, What I'm trying to point out is we sometimes think what we're doing is so good. And to be able to step back and go, yeah, it is good to have knowledge. It's great to investigate. You want to know what you're talking about. But sometimes you have to come out of the basement. Right. (laughs) Exactly. And connect with people. Sure. Yes. Right. Okay. Anything to an extreme is... Dangerous. All right, let me go to type six. And boy, these <laughs> these people are often referred to as the loyalist. And let me tell you, these are great people to have on your team because they their passion. Now, this is gonna this isn't why you want them. I'm saying you have to want them on your team is because their passion is fear, which again is their suffering. It is their suffering, and so why I say it's good to have them on there 
on your team is because they are so great at anticipating what might go wrong. And let me okay. tell you, <laughs> if you're going to go on a, a, I don't know, an outdoors adventure or even a, a long trip, they prepare for everything that might go wrong. So I have, I'm not making this up. I'm, right. I have heard this from type six from their own mouth. It's like, I pack all the medicine. I pack all the band-aids. Mm-hmm. I prepare, my goodness, mm-hmm. they probably were all good, Girl Scouts, yeah. but they prepare for what could go wrong. Yes. Um, and, and they're so, always concerned that things could not only go wrong, but end up being a disaster. Oh, my they gosh. They have lots of disaster scenarios. They can in their go minds. all the way to the end yeah. of a problem. Right. And in doing so, they can, well, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but yes, they can get so focused on what could go wrong that they, they kind of become paralyzed. But anyway, they, um, they are good at preparing. You know, worst case scenarios. They're not mm-hmm. that way. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not negative people, but they're they're good. They're cautious. They're mm-hmm. security oriented. And again, if I'm going on a wilderness trek, that's a great example. Right. <laughs> because me, I don't assume anything will go wrong. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is a whole other story <laughs> that we'll get there yeah. when we do type seven. But they can become type six can become so focused that they begin to become suspicious. They become suspicious of others, and then they become filled with self-doubt. So what seems so good to prepare for what could go wrong can ultimately become very paralyzing. That fear, that fear of not wanting to be caught, um, caught unaware. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, keeps them stuck in that fear. So again, these are loop situations. These things that seem so good yes. taken to the extreme yes. end up keeping you locked up in what we're calling is your passion, that yes. inner suffering. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a healthy and an unhealthy to all of our perspectives, motivations, our instincts, uh, and these perspectives that we're going to. There's a healthy and an unhealthy to all of it. And uh so that's why it's really good to understand, again, both sides of my nature. Oh, absolutely. And again, this is just a little, you know, tip of the iceberg on each of these types. So let me go ahead and move on to type eight. Like I said, or like Doug said, next week, we're just going to focus on seven, type seven and type nine, and we'll wrap it up for this series. So my goodness, I keep saying this about all of them. I love my type eights. I, I could list somebody I know personally, as each of you can, but my dad was a type eight, and he passed away when he was 61, so that's been 25 years ago or more, and so we, this is my mom and I, through much study, have determined that he was a type eight, so again, this is looking back, but we see so much. Let me interject real quick. How did you feel when you found out your dad was an eight? I I have to say that the, well, I was not surprised Mm -hmm. because I have an eight wing. Right. And I mean, we both have all wings and wings is a whole other subject. Um, So I related to it. I got Uh it. Uh-huh. You then, you you saw your dad in a whole different light, didn't you? But my mom saw my dad in a whole Mm. different light. And... You know, she had she has said, "I wish so much that mm, I knew this yeah. when he was alive." That's the point. Because when you're a type two and you're married to a type eight, yeah, that's a whole dynamic that can mm-hmm. be very challenging, yeah, as and, well as very awesome. Oh, and they figured a lot of stuff out mm-hmm. um, without the enneagram through right. therapy and counseling, like all of us do at other times, Mm -hmm. but, you know, they married very young, Mm -hmm. but she, one of the things is she just has uh, so much empathy for what that, what that was, what was driving him, because like I'm going to describe here in the type Mm eight, type eights can be called, oh, we all have different, you know, names, monikers as it is for each type, but sometimes types, type eights are called the challenger. But other times they're called the protector. So 
What is the passion for a type 8? It's called lust. And again, this is one of those words that if you just hear it without the context of the Enneagram language, it's like lust. Well, that's just all about sexuality. Well, it it can include it, but it absolutely is not um, just speaking about sexual lust. It is that desire for intensity. Oh, they just have that lust, that passion for life. And if you know a type eight and you already understand the Enneagram, you understand that Without eights in our lives, so much would not get done. Again, there are assertive types on the Enneagram. Mm-hmm. A type three that we've said mm-hmm. is in that yep. assertive type, type. They get stuff done. And the type eights, they're great at taking the initiative, and they make things happen. But they see the world as unjust and power imbalanced. So what happens is they feel they need to dominate. But this is so that they are not controlled. Mm -hmm. So um, they want to be self-reliant. They want to prove their strength, and they resist weakness. But they're also called the protectors, like I said. They're the champions. So many times they are the ones who are big in activism. They champion for the underdog. Um, So they show that power. They, you know... A lot of times they just very much assert their strength because they want to make a difference in the world. So doesn't that sound good? Yeah. Yeah, They, my gosh, who doesn't need a champion for the Mm -hmm. underdog? Yep. But in their attempt to control the situation and to not be controlled, which is the ultimate reason for that, Mm -hmm. is they lose touch with vulnerability. Ah. They see it as weakness. Uh Ah. So they resist letting their feelings be seen. Now, I want to for you to make no mistake about this. Eights are very feeling. They have, they have that mushy heart, but they kind of have that cactus exterior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but they keep up that power mm-hmm. facade as it is. Yes. So they aren't hurt. Yes. And so, they, they may come off as overbearing. Oh, my gosh. You yeah. might, These people you know in your life that just are always overbearing. Or... They, be, they get labeled bullies. Bullies, yeah. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, they are not. They are just trying to resist something where they were, they felt vulnerable. They may have been hurt. A lot of the reason we are why we are is, is sure. related to a trauma. Of course, or, yeah. Or some life change or situation mm-hmm. that yeah. caused us to form a defense mechanism. Yes. Um, and so... Oftentimes, they get labeled. Right. And it's not that they are power hungry all the time. They, they don't want to be hurt. Right. So that desire, that intensity, that passion um, that's called lust is really just covering up that where they're suffering inside of themselves of making sure that they don't get hurt. And once again, if you're unaware of that, as with every other number, it's what you're unaware of. The unconsciousness uh, things are the things that are constantly creeping up in your life and manifesting situations that are unpleasant or harmful or hurtful, and you're not aware of what's happening. You're not even aware of the dynamic in your own life and in your own thinking and, and relating and so forth because it is an unconscious desire and need until you go through and study, just like you do worldviews, until you understand the basis of it. Mm, mm, So much. And just a side note, apart from the deceitfulness of good, um, on type eights, that intensity that they, you know, portray, they really just want somebody to meet them with that intensity. So it's like, yes, you feel what I feel. We can do this together, and that is the strength of this part of a type eight is they are great at rallying people to come and understand that they're champions for the underdog. They want to make a difference in the world. They want to be good. So when we understand that about each other, then we can, we can have communications that either 
Uh, not either, but a communication that will lead to strengthening our relationships. That's right. what this all is about. That's why we said it earlier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so, so as we go into next week, uh, we're going to do seven and nine. And I didn't ask you this before we did the series or this episode or any episode, really. But would you say that you saved nines? Till the last, because we're the very best number. Would you say that's accurate? That we're the very best number. Well, your second, best. my number, your would number, be... my number is first. Okay, we probably should have <laughs> gone through this because I looked at the numbers. I was pretty sure my number was the best. Oh, one. because you sit at the top of the enneagram, oh, right? Well, for oh. a lot of reasons, because that's the way I think. <laughs> And I just thought, well, if that's the way I think and that's my number, that's got to be the best number. So maybe we can talk about that next week. You keep thinking that all week. And yeah. the next week we'll talk about that. Yeah. Well, But I will make this funny observation. Yeah. I have been through many Enneagram workshops and right. <laughs> classes. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, they save type seven till last. So yeah. they'll start with eight. Because yeah. it's like, all right, we're going to start at the top of this mm-hmm. up here in the body triad. Um, uh-huh. We go eight, nine, one, two, three, and end with seven. Because? Because they said if they start with sevens, that sevens will lose their focus. <laughs> check out. <laughs> check out. You'll be dreaming about other things and watching the birds out the window. <laughs> so. Well, that's something we can talk about when we get into sevens. Mm. So for all my Type 7 friends, you just tune in next week, and it's just going to all be good and fun stuff. Yeah. well, we'll <laughs> Or not. I, I, I think the reason, again, we saved 7 and 9 till last was so that we could expand this conversation and try to get across uh, the meaningfulness of the Enneagram and what it can bring to the abundance of life. Yes. So in the meantime, thank you guys so much. Please reach out to us if you have questions. And in the meantime, uh, I hope you love your number. If you don't know your number, then we'll be sending information about that through the Presence newsletter. And um, we'll see what we can do about that. Thank you. Have a great week.